to explain what we're doing here, um, we've uh, assembled a panel of, of speakers um, that I consider to be native plant aficionados from around the state. And collectively, they have knowledge of various kinds of plant activities, such as botany, horticulture, restoration, ethnobotany, and education. And you've already heard from a few of them um, in our feature talks thus far. And so during this session, um, I invite you in the audience to submit questions regarding native plants for the panelists to answer. So this is basically your, your time to ask um, any kind of native plant related burning questions you may have had. Um, I already see ones come in the, in, the, in the chat already, that's excellent. So any of these burning questions you may have had that you weren't sure who to direct them to or you've never had an opportunity to ask them, here's your chance. You have six panelists um, who have a, a wide variety of knowledge who are just here for the next 20 minutes or so to answer questions. And so uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and meet our esteemed panelists. So first is um, the Arizona Native Plant Society President, Doug Ripley. Uh, Doug retired to Cochise County in southeastern Arizona in 2007 after a 35-year career um, as an environmental scientist and natural resource manager with the U.S. Air Force. And he holds a BA and MA in biology from San Francisco State University and a PhD in plant ecology from Oregon State University. And since moving to Arizona, uh, his principal botanical interests have been in floristic and ecological studies. With his collaborator, Jim Verrier, he is currently completing a floristic study of the Dragoon Mountains. And as I do these introductions, based on um, the, uh, the panelists' bios, again, feel free to start thinking of questions that you think they might be able to answer. Um, next, our, our next panelist um, we heard from earlier tonight is Sue Carnahan. Uh, she collects and photographs plants in the grasslands and sky islands of southeastern Arizona, especially Santa Cruz County, as well as the Guaymas uh, San Carlos region of, of Sonora, Mexico. She is a self-taught botanist with expertise in plant uh, identification in these two areas. Welcome, Sue. Uh, our next panelist is John Shearing. John has an MS from the University of Arizona in plant science agronomy and a PhD from Texas A&M in plant breeding and genetics. He spent eight years um, uh, breeding field crops in West Africa, followed by 19 years as a research manager based in Switzerland. Uh, he retired to Tucson in 2005, but keeps busy with volunteer land restoration work, as well as buffalo grass and fountain grass weed control with Pima County BLM and US Forest Service. Uh, he's currently chairman of the Native Plant Society's Conservation Committee. Welcome, John. Also joining us is Steve Plath. Steve works for the Gila Watershed Partnership in Safford, Arizona, and as the manager of the Gila Native Plant Nursery. Uh, this nursery produces plant material for the partnership's restoration program along the Upper Gila River, which we just learned about in our talk from Kara Barron as well as contract grows for government and tribal agencies and other conservation organizations. Formerly, he was a habitat restoration specialist for Recon Environmental Incorporated in Tucson, and he's been growing native plants for revegetation, as well as implementing ecological restoration projects throughout the desert Southwest for the past 27 years. Uh, welcome, Steve. And next is Steve's colleague, Kara Barron, who we just heard from. Kara holds a master's degree in plant biology and conservation from ASU. And she currently works as the science and outreach manager at the Gila Watershed Partnership, where among other things, she supports their restoration program by collaborating on native plant material selection and managing the collection and curation of seeds used in various projects along the upper Gila River in Graham County. She is a past president of the Phoenix chapter and is currently the Native Plant Society's president of the Upper Gila chapter. So welcome back, Kara. And lastly, we are joined by Cole Whitaker Larson. Cole is a PhD student at ASU studying the genetics and ethnobotany of agaves, especially those found in central Arizona. In the past, he completed a flora of the lower Verde River. So welcome again to all of our panelists. Um, we already see some hellos and questions coming in. So we will go ahead and get started and get through as many questions as we can um, by the end of the evening at nine o'clock. 
So I'm going to scroll back to the top um, to the very first question that came in before we even did introductions. Can a jojoba plant change sex? And maybe we should explain that um, jojobas actually are, you know, have two sexes. Um, but uh, would anyone like to start with this question? As far as I know, we there are female and male jojoba plants. And once a jojoba plant germinates and comes up, it's got a sex. And uh, unless there's some kind of hormonal change uh, that, that could be induced uh, by, by, a, by a scientist, I've never heard of the sex being changed. It just stays that way through the life of the plant. Yeah, I don't know that I've ever heard of uh... Jojobas changing sex or plants in general changing sex, not quite like frogs or amphibians. Um, so that that's that would be something uh, new and unusual for me. I did just see that Dr. Les Landrum said that uh, maybe that one uh, in his backyard seemed to have do that. So um, and Elizabeth Makings is um, confirming that uh, apparently they can and. Um, so yeah, I had never heard of that myself. Very interesting. Okay, well, there you have it. Right here during the panel, our panelists are learning from all of you as well. So yes. excellent question. <laughs> We're all <laughs> learning together. And thank you to the, those of you in the audience um, with, with the specific knowledge about that to help us, uh, help us learn about it. Just before you go on, uh -huh. Lisa, I see a couple of other comments. Okay. Uh, Les Landrum said, uh, I believe he's talking about uh, the jojoba he says, I think they can, at least I think it happened in my backyard. So there's some um, firsthand experience. And then Michelle Cloud Hughes uh, commented that Atriplex can change sex. So that's pretty important to know. Okay, well, sounds like there's uh, there's potential research to be done there um, with, with not just uh, jojoba, but other, other plants as well. All right, um, next. Uh, I thought this was also a great question. Uh, so how do we define native plants? So it's like, nat what is native? Well, I guess, uh, I, you know, from my perspective, from the nursery perspective and a grower perspective, that's always been my question for people coming to the nursery and wanting native plants. I say define native. You know, if I, if I look at native on my property or at the nursery, if I grew just natives, I would have, let's see, mesquite and uh, atroplex canescens and probably creosote and atroplex canescens and probably a handful of plants and atroplex canescens. Um, it's so, you know, <laughs> native within five miles is probably a six, six to 7,000 mile or foot elevation difference from the nursery site. So yeah, what is native? Um, if you're looking to grow a diverse array of plants in your, in your landscape, um, you might pull plants that are native to the state of Arizona, but nowhere near native to your property. So how do you define that? Do you define that by, um, you know, biotic communities? Do you define that by, you know, a, a, a one, one mile, two mile, 50 mile radius? Yeah, define native. You know, it's definitely one of those sticky things. Yeah, from a, from a grower's standpoint, it's not an easy answer because, of course, we all don't want just four wing salt bush in our in our landscapes that might otherwise be native on our property. <laughs> so, another consideration when you're trying to plant native plants is planting something that at least will support um, the local animals, the local fauna, so the local insects. If you plant a Texas species, it may not host the native insects at all, or a California species, even though it might do really well and you could say it's native to the desert southwest, you want to keep somewhat in your region. If you're in, if you live in the Tucson area, something in the Sonoran Desert or the, or the Arizona Upland, if you live in, in, in Flagstaff, you make a similar decision. Um, so, so right, you don't, as Steve said, it's not just what's native to your yard because you end up with all the weeds that are there. Um, then the other, the other question about native is native for kind of for how long? I mean, was it here um, 25,000 years ago or was it here 800 years ago? At some point, some things seem to be honorary native. Um, I know that's not probably satisfactory, but um, 
it's a question that's asked about certain species kind of forever. There are debates about some of the morning glories. How long have they been in the Southwest, for example, and are they really native or are they, did they arrive here? Are they adventive? I'll just second that. Um, the way I think about it, when I grow stuff in my yard, is if it's Sonoran, I live in, two, in Phoenix, and um, if it's a Sonoran desert plant um, or anything up to like 5,000 feet around the Sonoran desert, I plant it in my yard because I know, again, like what Sue said, it, it, I know it can host all of the, the insects and animals that like I want to see in my yard. So that's kind of how I define, uh, I guess, biotic communities is the best. Well, in, in my case, I, um you know, recognizing there are many subtleties as to what exactly constitutes a native plant. And there'd be many different definitions, I suppose. But frankly, what I tend to go with is when did the plant show up? <laughs> in other words, um, and one defining milestone in my mind is perhaps at the time of European settlement in, in our area. So, that kind of narrows it down a fair amount, um, whether these things were brought from afar, even though it's far from precise. But you know, when you look at um, reference books and what have you, typically they it's stated what the opinion is on whether it's native or a non-native plant, using I, I think that criterion, frankly. I just want to add something. Um, if anybody, if if you if anybody hasn't read Braiding Sweetgrass, um, Robin Wall Kimmerer has a really great uh, definition of native and naturalized. Um, and I don't want to spoil it because I think everybody should read this book. But Braiding Sweetgrass, um, I highly recommend that. Great recommendation. Thank you, Cole. All right, next question. Um, what causes low breaking arms on saguaro? There may be a lot of causes, but I, I've seen it personally a lot following the hard freeze of February 2011. And what happened there is that you had a necrosis that happened in kind of the armpit. You know, if you say that a saguaro arm has an armpit, the saguaro arm is going up, its armpit is here. Uh, very often, uh, that's where a lot of the cold air settled, and then you had the dying of cells and the weakening of cells. And about the next two years after that freeze, very often we would see arms start to droop, and they would droop almost down to the ground. And then with good rains, they would try to grow back up, but the arms would be droopy and down. And what happens is that you have a, a, a heavy weight down there and then under stress, the, the plants break off. And we, we see that a lot. There may be other causes, but for sure, uh, the after effects of, of freeze uh, can definitely cause it. Yeah, I, I, I think I've had that, I had that exact situation you just described happen to the saguaro in my yard, so. Um, thanks for explaining that so so eloquently. Um, another question: um, Has anyone had experience with growing uh, Aristolochia wastani from seed? And I probably butchered that, but hopefully you know what I'm saying, or you can read it in the chat. I have Aristolochia. <laughs> oh, yeah, I heard I, a yes. Who said yes? Uh, so I have. Um, I'm actually helping uh, Natalie. Um, Melkoff at the Desert Botanic Garden get like increase her seed. She gave me a plant, and so I was growing it out to give her seed. But they they produce a lot, um, and they've just started to pop up around there, uh, around where the other one was planted. Um, my biggest piece of advice, I guess, would just be give it enough water, um, and as long as it's as long as it's well enough shaded, it should do okay. Um, but otherwise, I would. Uh, ask Natalie Melkoff at the DBG. All right, great. And um, next, are we losing any native plant species, I'll say specifically here in Arizona, due to climate change? Ooh. I know, <laughs> let's just, let's say those, those plants that maybe are already considered rare or endangered, 
maybe in your opinion, do you think that that is partially or maybe primarily due to climate change? We're definitely seeing some of the pre-Columbian, the uh, pre-Columbian domesticated agaves. Um, we're seeing them die off uh, for sure because of climate change. Um, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Anyone else with, with uh, anything that you've noticed or heard about? Well, I, I think many people have known for years that there's been significant die-off of a scrubing mesquite, Prosopis pubescens, um, throughout most of our riparian areas. And there's been a lot of theories. I don't think anybody's come up with anything conclusive. But I, in my opinion, I think that uh, climate change is uh, probably having a significant uh, exacerbation of that, if not a primary cause of it. Um, they're an unusual uh, mesquite. Uh, they don't, they like their toes in the water and they don't like excessive salts. And when, with our riparian systems being so um, impacted by a lack of pulses and flooding events to flush salts and silts and debris and move soils around, um, I, I, I think they're kind of the canary in the coal mine uh, so to speak, of, you know, health of riparian systems. And I think, and obviously man's impact on, uh, you know, sucking every drop of water of, out of riparian systems before they even reach their uh, terminus. Um, I think I've, it's just my opinion. Again, at this point, I think everybody's opinion is, is anecdotal. I don't know that there's been any hard research as to why the decline of of uh, scrubbing mesquites is such, but uh, I think that's a contributor. Okay, another question. Are the stomata on both sides of leaves and also where are the stomata on the saguaro? Well, the stomata on saguaros, um, like all cacti, basically is on the stem surface of the, of the plants. Um, and as a result, you know, that shape, if you think of a cylindrical or a um, spherical shape, um, that's probably the least amount of surface area a plant can achieve. Uh, if you think of a leafy plant, and you, if you multiply that leaf surface compared to a sphere, uh, the leafy surface has far more uh, surface area in which if you open your stomata, you can lose moisture. And so the saguaros and, and all cacti have it just basically on their uh, epidermis um, throughout the stem. And of course, through that, they're able to perform crashulation acid metabolism. So, and that goes into a whole nother <laughs> ball of wax. Um, at least my early you know, study of, of plants early on, the majority of stomata are on the underside surfaces of, of leaves. Uh, though that depending upon the species, there can be some on the surface. So that's, boy, that, that varies all over the map. There isn't any one single answer, but the majority of leafy plants have, have the stomata on the undersides of the leaves. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, um, a follow-up to our discussion uh, a couple minutes ago about what's native. Um, does the botany community have a set period of time when an introduced plant becomes naturalized or labeled naturalized? I don't think there's any standardization there. I think it depends on who you ask. <laughs> okay, so asking six of you, is that a consensus there? Or if I ask someone else, is the answer gonna be different? It's three months, I believe. No, I'm just, <laughs> just kidding. All right, I don't think there's, there's a, a botanist humor. <laughs> All right, um, next. Um, so this one I think specifically for Stu, you came to native plants after much experience with birds. Has your learning process from for, um, plants benefited from your early experiences in ways that might help others grow as botanists? Interesting. Okay. Um, I'm not really an expert birder. I'm a kind of obsessive birder, but my obsession with birds turned into obsessiveness with plants. And so when I started learning plants, I really sort of dove into it and was reading floras at night and paging through books and trying to figure out, I mean, I knew nothing. I have, I will admit, I have never taken a botany course in my life, taken science, but not botany. So 
everything I've learned is from experience and reading floras and looking things up and, and um, that kind of thing. And so, I mean, persistence and obsessiveness, I'm not sure I'd recommend obsessiveness to other people, but it really worked for me and um, it's fun and it continues to be fun. So I don't know if that's helpful or not, but I just, you know, I've made my share of mistakes. I still make mistakes. Um, sometimes they're embarrassing and I think, oh, I should have known all that stuff, but then everybody makes some mistakes. So you get over that and you move on and you learn the next new thing that comes your way. So um, I just encourage you, if, you, if you're interested, just dive in and get the best books you can and make some friends and look at good websites and go to herbaria and look at the plants in the herbarium. Great that's advice. Helpful. Thank you. Um, next, um, a kind of, I think a follow-up to the earlier question about the, the low, um, low um, arms on saguaros. It says atypical low branching saguaro as well. Um, Amber saw a significant number of low branching um, up in uh, Peoria Paloma Community Park. And maybe your explanation, John, is why there was a large number. It was a kind of weather event that caused that. And it, would that be the reason why you would see so many in one area? Well, there are also, uh, everybody likes to attribute for saguaros soil effects or rain effects, but saguaros, like everything else, have genetics. And there are genetic swarms of certain characteristic in an area. So if you see low, low uh, uh, branching, branching arms, and you see a lot of them around, you probably have on your hands a genetic swarm of genes that are being exchanged back and forth at high frequency that determine long arms. And we certainly see this with uh, saguaros with multiple arms. And you look around, you know, it isn't just one, but they're, they're, it's a big genetic swarm, families of them, or a single, a single plant, a single column without any arms. Uh, so let's not forget the genetic components uh, when we talk about cacti, because I mean, they have oh. genetics like everything else. Genetic variants. Also, you, even just the mechanics of hydration, you know, especially cacti. I mean, I've seen cacti in, in the field, um, you know, after abundant rainfalls, especially if they've been dry for a very long period of time, which of course our cacti have had. And they take up so much water so fast that even the low globular cactus or, or, or clustering cactus, uh, their stems will split because they've taken yeah. up so much water so fast. And likewise, if you have a saguaro that's been subjected to extreme drought conditions for periods of time, you know, over time, just like for anybody, you know, those arm joints get weakened or, or stressed. And then all of a sudden that plant's doing everything it can to take up every ounce of water that it can. And all of a sudden that arm and branch all of a sudden has a weight load that just, you know, the plant can't bear. You know, and I've also seen plants where they just literally outgrow themselves. So yeah, there's any number of factors that can contribute to that. Like John said, the freezing, I've seen that and heard of that for years, um, but just simple hydrology alone. Uh, can impact how a plant, you know, can withstand its own mass, um, especially after extended drought periods. All right, thank you. I'm going to skip the next question and, and I'm going to actually end on that one because it looks like a fun one to just go around the panel and end with. Um, but I'm going to go to the question, um, kind of a follow up about the agave, um, the pre Columbia agave loss due to climate change. Um, would you say that? or that that might be primarily due to droughts or due to heat or something else? Um, uh, it's, de it's definitely both. Um, it's primarily heat. Like a lot of the pre-Columbian domesticates are found over four, around and over 4,000 feet um, elevation. And they were formally tended um, and they were growing, they usually grow in the, the linear alignments and like rock piles. Um, so they, there was soil moisture there from you know because of the rock piles there's still soil moisture there but with things getting a lot hotter um especially at the those kind of higher elevations like in central arizona um that's having an impact and then the 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 
drought side of things is is reducing the amount of um uh young pups and um seeds well, they don't typically reproduce with seeds but it's it's reducing the number of pups that can survive year to year because of the lack of water so okay, okay. All right, and then yeah, we'll end on this question. Uh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you an either or. Um, either what is your favorite native plant for growing in the garden, or a bucket list plant you have to see in the wild? No, I'll start. I don't have a great um, answer here, but in our garden, we've tried to um, use native plants, of course, and I guess the one that does so well and is just fantastic is Benstam and Beria, which uh, we actually started from seed when we moved here. I collected seed along the highway, uh, Highway 191 up near um, uh, north of um, I-10. There's, uh, I guess the highway department has, has planted it there. But anyway, I collected a bucket full of seeds and sowed them around our house and in the garden. and. They're just unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, and they're so easy to grow. It's uh, just amazing. Yeah, so always great that, to be able to recommend a plant that grows super easy. <laughs> right. So I would really recommend that one. And you can just, if you see it growing along the side of the road, which you probably will, uh, you can just collect the seed yourself a little later in the, in the season. All right. Who would like to go next? I just thought of one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorites in my yard is chocolate flower. So that's Berlandiera lyrata. Um, and it smells amazing. It's easy to grow and, um, and it's really pretty and it brings a lot of the insects to the playground. So um, that, that's one of my favorites. Yeah, that's a great one too. We have a ton of that in our garden as well. <laughs> Uh, I'll go next. A, a butylon uh, uh, palmeri is my absolute favorite. Um, it's the same thing. It brings like all of the 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 insects in, and if if here in Phoenix, if you water it year round, it'll flower year round. Um, especially if you give it a little afternoon shade, that is just and it just cranks out growth. You have to beat that back, but it, everything seems to love that. I totally agree. And I saw one, one audience member has put their answer to this question in chat. And I do invite all of you in the audience as we're hearing the, the final few answers, feel free to write your answer to this question in chat. I'd love to see what, what everyone else's um, favorite, favorite plant is. All right, next, who's up? My, my very favorite plant, and it's so easy to grow, very little care, is, is the bee plant, Aloysia, Aloysia either gratissima or ridei. And um, give it a little bit of water, and it will flower a couple times a year, and it sends out a wonderful, wonderful aroma smell that that just fills your whole back backyard, and it attracts not just bees but all sorts of insects and butterflies. And then as it sets seed, one of the things that people don't really realize about bee plants is that it's an absolute aphrodisiac for um, uh, goldfinches. And goldfinches that you don't even see in the neighborhood suddenly flock to it, just as the seeds are, are, are nice and green and, and easy to eat. And, they'll, and they just take over the plants. It's, it's, it's just really, it, the only thing is it grows so much, you have to keep cutting, cutting out vegetation, but it's great. <laughs> I need the goldfinches to find mine because it's actually starting to take over my yard. It's setting seed everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and we're getting some great answers in the chat as well from our audience members. So feel free to keep those coming in. I think we still have two of our panelists to chime in on this question. Um, I'll chime in, but I'm gonna kind of cheat. One, I don't grow anything, so I can't talk about what to put in a garden. That's I fine. just kill things in plant presses. but. Um, but um, two of the two of the plants that were on my bucket list, I found this summer, and I was so excited about them because I found them in Santa Cruz County, where they're, you know, one was new to the county, one was not, and one is a little tiny polygola, polygola glochidiata, which has bright magenta flowers, 
And it's, of course, an annual. I'm not all about annuals, but these just happen to be ones that did well this summer. So Polygola glochidiata, um, I don't even know if it has a common name, but magenta flowers on a Polygola, and they're tiny. It was very cute. And then the Jacamantia that I talked about in my in my presentation, that the midnight blue cluster vine, which is a pretty good name for a common name. I don't like common names typically, but those were my bucket lists. Now I got to make a, another bucket list. All right. Yeah, I guess that's not a bad thing. <laughs> All right. And Steve, I think we still have to hear from you. Well, uh, my problem is what day is it to pick my favorite plant? <laughs> yeah, when you um, work in a nursery. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and anybody who's known me for any length of time knows that I'm a avid cactophile, cactoholic, whatever you, I love cacti. And so my front yard is basically a lot of cacti. There are other native plants and grasses and things in there, but cacti are my thing. And so, you know, everything from hedgehog cactus, Echinocerus uh, ingomini, uh, Echinocerus coccinius or triglycidiatus, the claret cup cacti. I love those because of their red tubular flowers. Uh, the mammillaria, mammillaria grami. I mean, any of the native cacti. And, you know, what's, what's funny is everybody talks about pollinator plants. And I think cacti get ignored. And yet when they are in full bloom, starting March, April, going into May, there is not a bee on the planet that will not visit a cactus flower and literally wallow in the pollen. You see these, these insects swimming in the stigmas and they're just wallowing in there, covering their bodies with the pollen. And that's so fun and entertaining to watch. And these, these bees will exhaust themselves and literally fall asleep in the cactus flowers um, till they kind of come to and, and off they go. So, yeah, I, I would like to encourage people. I know yet they have thorns, so do roses, so do a lot of plants that everybody loves. Uh, don't go play in them. That's, that's the key. But, uh, you know, plant cacti in your yard, you, you're, you're really going to make some bees and other pollinators uh, very happy. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for all of the excellent answers and for sticking around an extra 12 minutes and to the audience for the excellent questions and being so engaged even after already two hours of sessions. So I really appreciate it.